And action. The principles of Freemasonry are very much aligned to the principles that are at the core of the revolution. Masonic thought was Enlightenment thought, and that was shaping the founding of the country. George Washington even made a statement that America needs to become what Freemasonry already is, and that's a lodge of virtues. The development of Vermont runs through Masonic channels from the 1770s up into the 1830s. If you go across the state, lots of the village leadership would be Masonic. They were the groups that brought together capital to create banks and get post offices placed in areas. Uh, later they build railroads, they build canals. The first Vermont coin has Masonic symbolism on it. It has an all-seeing eye, and the flip side has a rising sun over a middle section. There's such a burst of interest in Masonry from, say, 1800 to 1820, you know, where the number of lodges in the state triples. They actually make a transfer at this period from being a secret society into a sacred society. They will defend their secrecy on the grounds of sacredness. These are the ancient rituals from Solomon's Temple. The craft has been passed down from God. They have this really intoxicating mix of philosophy and claims to antiquity. The continuation of those ancient rituals are happening behind closed doors that not everybody can participate in. The Masons are being accepted essentially as a competition to the church. They're, in a sense, a moral competition with the established religions. So it feeds the perception of them really as this sort of unique elite group. My brothers, we have dedicated this lodge this evening using a ceremony which is over 275 years old. A similar ceremony was used by our first president and a Mason, George Washington, when he dedicated the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. I declare in the name of Freemasonry that Granite Lodge number 35 is duly dedicated according to Freemasonry. A very different sort of society had come into being in the wake of transportation improvements by the mid-1820s. First with the introduction of steamboats, and then with the introduction of the Champlain Canal, which was completed in 1823. Vermont was becoming profoundly capitalist. It was becoming a society not of subsistence farmers, gentry, and small craftsmen, but a society of commercial farmers, capitalists, and factory workers. A lot of towns in Vermont began to be severely disrupted, and for a significant number of Vermonters, the object of their scorn was the Masonic Lodges. As the population in New England and upstate New York became more mobile, people in the business community needed a way to recognize each other, and so the Masonic Lodges became a way to do this. In return, you had to be faithful to the Lodge. You had to vote for a Mason over a non-Mason in political elections. And so it really went from being a philosophical organization to being, to a great extent, a network of businessmen. It tended to be the most commercial towns that were the strongly Masonic and the most rural villages that were anti-Masonic. People who were previously friends would cross the street so that they didn't have to talk to each other. At weddings, the Masons would sit on one side of the aisle and the non-Masons would sit on the other. When an anti-Masonic lecturer came to a church to lecture in Barnet, after he got the crowd extremely riled up, they grabbed tree limbs out in the yard and ran around the graveyard, smashing the gravestones that had Masonic symbols on them. It was a very contentious time.
the anti-Masonic movement really caught fire in Vermont. In 1828, there were town meetings held throughout the state by people opposed to the Masonic order. This grew quickly into a real political movement. In 1831, Vermont elects an anti-Mason governor, and he served four one-year terms as governor of Vermont. In 1832, there's a presidential election, and the anti-Masons are running a presidential candidate, William Wirt of Maryland. William Wirt carries all of Vermont, takes all seven of its electoral votes. No other state did he succeed like that. Also in Vermont, we send William Slade to Washington. Slade goes to Washington as an anti-Mason, but he soon will emerge as a major opponent of slavery. There were hotbeds of the anti-Mason movement in Vermont. Randolph was one, Woodstock was one, but no town was as anti-Mason as here in Danville. The editor of the local paper, a man named Eaton, took up the cause and editorialized in favor of it over and over and over again. The newspaper men who supported it hammered at masonry because they found it to be elitist they found it to go against democratic principles. They didn't like its secrecy. 